and the negative is female, and the order and the yes and the positive is male, and a lot of these things that I have a lot of trouble uh, accepting. Hi there, Steve Coffin here, and today I'm going to talk on a different subject. I'm going to talk a bit about a book that I bought called uh, 10 Rules for Life, excuse me, 12 Rules for Life by Jordan Peterson. Remember, if you enjoy these videos, please subscribe, click on the bell for notifications. If you follow me on a podcast service, please leave a comment. So uh, I'm going to talk about this book and I'll tell you why. Uh, and I'm going to relate it a bit to language learning because that's what I always like to do. So I became aware of Jordan Peterson when uh, he was quite controversial because he opposed the sort of, he, he was a professor. Okay, step back a bit. Professor at the University of Toronto, professor of psychology. The university said, you now have to use these gender neutral pronouns. He said, I'm not going to use general gender neutral pronouns. You can't tell me how to speak or how to use the language. And he has become a, a leading figure in sort of opposing what is known as wokeism. In other words, uh, the idea that everyone has to confirm, conform to certain patterns of behavior uh, regarding, you know, gender categories or race relations or uh, attitudes towards a whole number of things. That this is the accepted correct way of behaving and anyone who doesn't behave in this way is therefore a bad person and not welcome at a university and so forth and so on. And this book has been a, a bestseller. I don't know how many million copies it's sold. He's written a sequel. So I said, I, and he's Canadian. He's from uh, Fairview, Alberta. And I'm very familiar with that area, Peace River Al region in Alberta, because I did a lot of business there in forest products. And I know the area, I know the people, uh, some of the people, you know, up in that area, great area, great country. So I began to read through it and I'd be interested in the reaction of people who have read the book. Uh, I have sort of leafed through it. Um, my reaction is that he has sort of this tremendous knowledge of psychology, of uh, mythology, of religion. And so he sort of describes, you know, a world that our lives are, in his view, tragic or full of evil. I mean, eventually we die and there are lots of bad things that happen. Bad things have always happened. And so in this world of chaos, then how should we lead our lives? Uh, in his first chapter, which he calls... Uh, you know, stand up straight with your shoulders back. In other words, you should have a very erect posture. And he ties that in some way to this idea of, of a hierarchy uh, in the animal kingdom, hierarchy in amongst human beings, that that structure or hierarchy is kind of embedded in our genetic, uh, you know, we're predisposed to be more dominant or less dominant. Uh, he even suggests that the chaos portion of lives is sort of, uh, and the negative is female, and the order, and the yes, and the positive is male, and a lot of these things that I have a lot of trouble uh, accepting. Uh, and in fact, as a general rule, I find that his 12 rules don't really relate to the subject matter that he discusses within each chapter. He has a chapter for each rule. And so instead you have these themes that sort of pervade all of these chapters and that is this sense of sort of a dark world and the only way we can survive is if we maintain certain structures. He seems to favor a patriarchy because historically and perhaps in the animal kingdom the male is typically stronger uh, and uh, that's a good thing and uh, where there is and, and all the while, of course, he's pushing back against this sort of woke thing, which makes any sort of expression of power a bad thing. Whereas, in fact, to a large extent, people who have more power, but not always, but in many cases, they have earned that position of power because they have certain abilities. And so he stresses this, that uh, we can't just condemn the patriarchy. But by the same token, countries that are 
where the patriarchal sort of pattern is stronger aren't necessarily happier countries. Uh, any survey of happiness typically shows countries like Denmark uh, and Scandinavia as having the highest happiness coefficient to the extent that we can measure that effectively. It's somewhat subjective. And those countries typically have sort of a less dominant patriarchal structure than some more traditional societies. But nevertheless, he does make the point that the world we live in is one where you know, the individual is important. In fact, that's the, I should go there right away. I saw a video of his, I did some research on the internet, where he makes the point that our Western society is uh, very successful. And, and so again, he's defending Western society from those who almost systematically want to tear it down. Fair enough. Uh, there's definitely a tendency for intellectuals, people at universities, to want to tear down the established or to criticize the established order. Uh, this was the case with the prevalence of Marxists in the economics department. It's the uh, example today where in all of the humanities you have this strong preponderance of people who are quote progressive uh, and who are therefore very critical of the established society. When in fact this is, the established society is really not that bad. However, where I have trouble with, with Jordan Peterson is he calls this Western society, Western culture. But, but the fact is that it's modern society, that Western society 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, over 2,000 years ago in Rome, in Greece, where half the population were slaves, uh, in, in the Middle Ages when people were persecuted for what they thought, for their religions, uh, not that great at a time, in many cases throughout history, where other civilizations, it might be, you know, the, the Chinese uh, civilization during the, uh, the Tang Dynasty, for example. Uh, maybe Hangzhou was a nicer place to live than London. Uh, you know, I get my dates, but certainly six, you know, Middle Ages in uh, Europe wasn't all that great in terms of lifespan, in terms of the sophistication, in terms of respect for individuals and so forth and so on. Uh, in the modern age, a country like Japan has a legal system uh, which is uh, certainly no worse than uh, in Western Europe or North America. It certainly has health outcomes that are better. Uh, it uh, functions very effectively as a society. So I, I think this idea of sort of to stick up for Western society and we're the best and stuff, I find that a little bit inaccurate, uh, to say the least. And even to the extent of the sort of technological achievements in Western society, they are the result of technological advances in other countries, in mathematics, in India, and, and uh, uh, science in China 2,000 years ago, and... Uh, even, uh, you know, Arab and, and Muslim scholars who sort of uh, kept Greek learning and Indian learning and, and Islamic learning and eventually brought that back to the West so that in, say, the 12th, 13th, 14th century, many of these things were rediscovered and this then led to the uh, Renaissance and so forth and so on. The world is an interconnected place. And I think, you know, to use his... Uh, imagery, you know, to stand up on your hind legs and say ours is the best, uh, I don't think it's very helpful. I think if he, just as I'm now learning so much more about Iran and Persian history and, and the, the uh, Cyrus is the cylinder where he recognized the freedom of religion and freedom of, of different ethnic groups, groups to have every right in the, in the old uh, Persian Empire, it, it, it kind of enables you to see the world through different lenses, the lenses of different languages. And, uh, and I think that gives you a better perspective. Uh, and, uh, but I do agree that, uh, that one shouldn't be overly critical of, of our society. You know, there's a lot of this sort of anti-capitalist society, but I'm always aware of the fact that the products that I use, this camera that I'm using, which is made in Japan, or maybe it's made in China under license from the Japanese, uh, the food I eat, the products I use, the, the daily functioning of our society, it's, you know, all kinds of people making my life richer and better. That's how our societies have evolved. Of course, it ends at some point. Uh, I don't think that people are all out to get me. 
I don't think there's so many evil people out there, but there are evil people. And so in terms of how we lead our lives, uh, I don't think we should say it's all the individual. It's not all the individual. I think we need to obviously live our lives in a way that, you know, we are responsible for our lives, but we are also helpful to others, which is in a way in his book, but it's sort of hidden in amongst all the sort of dark mythology and, you know, biblical references to punishments and uh, and all kinds of dark stuff. He, he creates this sort of sense that the world is this uh, chaotic place and uh, it's sort of difficult to extract yourself from the tragedy and the pain of living. And to do that, you got to, you know, uh, follow these rules. Basic self-help things there that are universal, like tell the truth and listen to others and uh, you know look after yourself be responsible to yourself and all this stuff is good and uh, but but uh, i think the main reason why his his book has um, been so successful i think there are two reasons one is there's quite a breadth of of information about psychology and and mythology and religions and all these different ways that people try to explain the mystery of life and then he extracts out of that a few rules, he claims, that can help mitigate this, this uh, chaos and enable you to live a meaningful life. But where that meaning is, you have to find for yourself. I think, obviously, our families provide meaning, but there are also dysfunctional families. Uh, for me, um, learning languages provide meaning because I discover more about different cultures. Uh, people who are bird watchers, uh, people who are uh, involved in charities. There was a gentleman uh, discovered the other day who he has set up his whole house as a as a as a you know a recycling depot, and you can take your empty milk bottles, your empty you know water bottles, your empty wine bottles, take them up there, drop them there, and he will make sure that that is converted into because the recycling system pays you for them, and from that he gives food vouchers to homeless people. That's his life. That's meaning. He has. That's his meaning. Wonderful. Um, so we find meaning wherever it is. Like I uh, and and I think where I I agree with with uh, Jordan Peterson is pushback on all this woke stuff. Like this gender neutral pronouns. It doesn't matter if if there is a non binary person, a trans gendered person, and I refer to him or her as him or her, and they say to me, no, I'd rather be referred to as this, fine. Um, the idea that somehow a gender neutral pronoun has some great significance, I don't buy. Uh, in Persian and in Turkish, they have gender neutral pronouns. And yet both of those societies are more patriarchal and less tolerant of non-traditional gender roles or non-traditional sexual orientation. So the fact that a, a gender neutral pronoun is used is meaningless. And why, you know, whatever the number is of these non-binary people in our society, I don't know, 0 0.01%, 2%, whatever the number is, why should everyone have to change their um, speech patterns to accommodate this the main purpose is to demonstrate how progressive we are. See, I use my preferred, like just by saying, my preferred pronouns are he and him. Now I've said I'm progressive. It's meaningless, actually. Uh, it's like in the company that I ran, we have always hired the best person available. We've had Japanese people, Chinese people, Sikhs there. We've had Romanians, Russians, um, I don't know, Filipinos. We've had gay people. We've had everybody, the best person we can find, always. But I don't believe in saying, I am a diversity, you know, employer. I sign on to the diversity statement. I don't need all of that. That's the sort of virtue signaling. Rather, the principle should be you hire the best person available. And I am responsible to myself, to my employees. And that's how I, I so to that extent, making these kinds of virtue signaling statements uh, a condition of employment or, uh, you know, the whole department set up to deal with diversity and diversity is better than lack of diversity, for example. I don't buy that because 
Japan, uh, Korea, Finland, they don't have much diversity and they're successful societies. And you have other societies like Canada, if you go to Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, you're going to find a tremendous diversity of religion, and race and ethnicity. But what really matters is diversity of points of view. And I don't think the societies that are diverse ethnically or in terms of gender are necessarily better. Uh, than less diverse. But I think it's probably a good idea to have a diversity of views. And in that regard, I think Jordan Peterson, while I find a lot of his stuff I don't necessarily agree with, it's valuable to have people like that who are pushing back against this attempted, you know, conformity, imposition on people. You must say this, you must make a statement on diversity, you must uh, use gender neutral pronouns, and so forth and so on. So. With that, I think I've stirred up, hopefully, a bit of controversy. And, but I think diversity of views is important and we should respect everyone's uh, point of view and be willing to uh, discuss and defend our views and also take into consideration the uh, counter arguments. There you have it. Thank you for listening. Bye for now.